if you knew you were about to die, what would you do? All right, would you weep and mourn your impending loss? Or might you race through your bucket list with blind ambition? Would you go on a cruise or max out your credit cards, buying plane tickets to travel to some exotic destination? Would you throw a huge party for all your family and closest friends, gorge yourself on your favorite food and wine? Would you revisit your will? Would you write letters to those you love, telling them how much they have meant to you? What would you do if you knew you were about to die? Jesus knew. And he worked for justice. Condemned violence and oppression and exploitation, he healed the afflicted, blessed the poor, challenged the rich, welcomed the children. He spent time in prayer, and he ate a simple meal with his closest friends before washing their feet. In his final moments, he spoke words of assurance to the suffering thief who was dying on the cross beside him. Jesus knew he was going to die. Most recently in Luke's gospel, he has predicted his own suffering, death, and resurrection to his disciples in the 18th chapter. But, writes Luke, the 12 understood none of these words. We know Jesus had his disciples' full attention, but he didn't quite have their full understanding. I mean, this remains true today. Why else would there be hundreds of different Christian denominations unless Jesus had captured the attention of great multitudes over the centuries only to have the meaning of his lessons and life and death and resurrection be misunderstood and debated and fought over. In his book, Saving God from Religion, a minister's search for faith in a skeptical age, Robin R. Myers invites us to consider this remarkable fact. In the Sermon on the Mount, there is not a single word about what to believe. Only words about what to do and how to be. Now, by the time the Nicene Creed was written, only three centuries later, there is not a single word in it about what to do and how to be. Only words about what to believe. Despite Jesus' clear command to love your neighbor, we are still, as did the young legal expert, asking, but who is my neighbor? Right? We're still trying to understand where we can draw the line because Jesus couldn't possibly have meant we should love everyone. Right? The Gospels and Epistles are fraught with examples of Jesus attaining people's full attention without their full understanding. Just as the Bible is fraught with similar examples of those who are fully aware of God without being fully obedient to God. Today's gospel story of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem on the back of a colt is no different. But first off, I must confess my own long-standing misunderstanding of this text, which has held my attention for decades. As a young child, I can remember getting a palm branch as I walked into church on Palm Sunday. And then the pastor's instruction that any time we spoke or sang the word, Hosanna, we were to wave our palm branch. What a joyful celebration. 
And for the longest time, it was my understanding that Hosanna must loosely translate to something like, Hooray! It is really surprising how many church hymns and songs are about joyful Hosanna, or Hosanna as praise, laments the Reverend Andrew Stellick. It is an unfortunate misunderstanding. In Luke's version of the event, the word Hosanna does not appear, nor do palm branches. But he does have the crowds quoting from Psalm 118. Verse 26, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heavens. John and Matthew's Gospels add that the people are shouting Hosanna, which comes from the previous verse, verse 25 of the same psalm. And as I told the children, Hosanna from the Hebrew, Hoshiana, translates not to hooray, but save us. The footnote for this verse in my study Bible says this, the sudden shift to petition is surprising. Apparently, the psalmist's rescue inspires the congregation to ask for deliverance as well. In any case, this petition makes the psalm useful for all the people of God in all times as new threats to life arise. The recording chorus of Psalm 118 celebrates the chesed, the enduring and faithful love of God. It is largely a celebratory psalm. But this Hosanna, this cry of the crowd so often associated with Jesus' ride into Jerusalem, stands out like a driftwood bonfire on a deserted island, spelling out the letters S O S. These crowds are gathering to celebrate the arrival of Jesus. Yes, they are praising God, as Luke tells us, because of all the mighty things they had seen. But their celebration also carries with it the expectation that Jesus, the Messiah, has come to save them. And it is this expectation for salvation in this expectation that we see the dissonance between their attention and their understanding. The result of this dissonance plays out over the following week as Jesus' failure to live up to their expectations of salvation turned members of the cheering crowd who welcomed him into the city into members of the jeering crowd who shouted for his crucifixion just days later. I can't think of a better modern example of this dissonance than a meme I saw recently which depicts Jesus draped in an American flag and holding an AR-15 with the text that reads, if Jesus had a gun, he'd still be alive today. Full attention. Flagrant misunderstanding. The Palm Sunday crowd's expectation of salvation was built on an interpretation of scriptures by which they understood the Messiah as a military leader who would overthrow their oppressors with violence, a literal king who would sit on a literal throne and exercise power in the only way they were familiar with power being exercised. Not only did many people expect this, but it also seems that this expectation was used to capture the attention of political leaders in the Roman Empire, those with the power to arrest and persecute and sentence Jesus to death. The revelation of this dissonance is the purpose of the cross. The cross of Jesus draws our full attention 
to our complete misunderstanding. What was hidden to us becomes painfully clear as the innocent embodiment of God's chesed, God's enduring and faithful love, is executed for crimes he never committed. There is tremendous misunderstanding about God's will for our world. And it is tragic how often misunderstanding leads to arguments and fighting and violence and suffering. Indeed, a quick glance around this broken world makes it painfully obvious that we don't need more arguments on behalf of God, writes Robin Myers. We need more people who live as if they are in covenant with unconditional love, which is our best definition of God. Misunderstanding leads to argument because we so commonly confront the one with whom we disagree with condemnation. And condemnation feels good, and it is now a staple of religion, politics, and the media, both left and right. But it changes nothing, explains Myers. Compassion, on the other hand, changes everything. He adds, Jesus did not come to die, rendering his life and teaching secondary. He died because of his life and teachings. So as we approach the passion moment, as our life and faith converge at the cross, may our attention be on Jesus, on his life and teachings, and also on our deep need for grace, where we have, as Avery reminded us, fallen short of fully understanding the what to do and how to be of his command to love our neighbor. May our attention to the cross open our eyes anew to what God is doing in the world here and now and unstop our ears to hear the invitation to join our lives to Jesus' enduring legacy of love. Let us pray. Open our eyes, our hearts, our minds, our ears to see and hear and feel and understand your purpose in us and in this world. May we live and move and breathe for the sake of your undying love for us and for all of creation. This we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. And let the church say, Amen.